The process is flawed. There is an ancient precedent to no one will we refuse or delay right or justice. It comes from Clause 40 of the Magna Carta, 1215. Our daughter has been punished by the criminal justice system without a fair and proper hearing. Her intellectual disability pro um, prohibits her from defending herself. She lacks the capacity to understand the circumstances surrounding any charges, and she is unable to articulate her instructions. In October 2010, in a landmark decision, the Court of Appeal agreed that her convictions in the Magistrate Court were a miscarriage of justice because she was unfit to plead at the time she pleaded guilty and was sentenced, and all 15 convictions were expunged. Our daughter continues to be required to sign a bail undertaking document which she has no understanding about. This requirement is setting her up to fail again. The Bail Act 1980 at Section 11A allows for the release of a person with an impairment of mind, but it has not been exercised in our daughter's case. With all of the knowledge that the courts have about our daughter, why is it not automatically invoked? Finally, there has to be political will for law reform. The government's response to the strong recommendation in the appeal judgment that there is a need for both administrative and legislative reform in Queensland to ensure that our most vulnerable are protected from significant injustice is much muted. Our appeal, our appeal identified a gap in the law, a hiatus was how it was described in the judgment. But law reform alone will not be sufficient there needs to be a holistic response in the magistrate's court to all of the issues. We need appropriate interventions. We need advocacy. We need support. We need smarter laws, not tougher. We need smarter court processes. That was brilliant, Colleen. Well done. Well done, Colleen. That was wonderful. I know you were so nervous about that. Well done. And John, what about your moral support? Brilliant. <laughs> you were brilliant. Alina Annabelle, I come to you now. Um, that, that story is astounding in its depth in the, the 50 court appearances, guys. Um, how many people do you think with intellectual disabilities are currently serving sentences in Queensland jails? People getting to jail with intellectual disabilities, not really understanding how they got there? Well, we can't tell you because we don't actually routinely screen for an intellectual disability in the correctional centres, um, and we haven't historically in Queensland. Uh, currently, we do have a trial in three South East Queensland correctional centres where we are screening um, using Professor Hayes, um, Hayes' screening tool. Um, and then providing some differentiated services and some um, through care services upon release. Um, but at this stage, the numbers um, of people with intellectual disability in custody, we can't, we can't let you know what they are, or we don't have those numbers to identify. It feels like a section of the community that's been left behind, doesn't it? I mean, here we are in 2011 and there's still people incarcerated who don't know why. Genuinely don't know why. Amazing. A little earlier we talked about what court-based support services are available to people with intellectual disabilities like Andy who've been charged with an offence. Many people with intellectual disabilities living in our communities rely upon support from family, friends, carers, government support services and community groups to, to live active lives. Dr Geoffrey Chan. My friend, what sorts of support services are available to people with intellectual disabilities? Okay, the Department of Community Services, uh, so the Department of Community so Disability Services, uh, provide a whole range of support services. That inc includes accommodation, respite, uh, community support, and community access. For the period of the financial year 2009-2010, um, about 12,409 people receive uh, services. Or people with intellectual disability receive services. Community support can range from therapy, behaviour support, early childhood intervention, counselling, resource and information, 
advocacy, local area coordination, and case management. Uh, of interest to in this hypothetical is the, uh, I'd like to mention the Carter Reform Review. Uh, and the review was commissioned by the government and it led to a, a six-year investment reform strategy called Positive Futures, where the government has invested $228 million in this very important reform. And the, the reform is in its fourth year. Uh, basically, uh, some of the highlights are that we have a, a stronger disability services act that's very human rights focused. We have the center of excellence for behavior support that uh, brings in the evidence to provide training, uh, evidence-based sort of um, uh, learning and development, uh, where they've provided more than you know 350 workshops to date. Uh, we've also em employed uh, 131 clinical professionals, uh, 17 from overseas. We have a mental health outreach service um, and a forensic disability service. And uh, last week, the parliament passed the forensic disability legislation. So there's been a lot of activities and, and services uh, being provided. I also think it's important to actually take, uh, in Andy's case, take a step back to highlight that what should have occurred with Andy, uh, perhaps if we, could, we could do this better, is to actually have a, a good clinical support model for Andy like what's triggering his stealing, uh, the shoplifting, what support that we can provide to, to train staff, to support staff, support Andy. And I think that's something that's missing. So what should have occurred is a good comprehensive assessment and uh, develop a good support plan for Andy. But those support services you talked about, that's sort of contingent upon people finding them, isn't it? There's no way to go out in the community and find the people who need them and bring them back. So maybe is that maybe where the gap is again in nice neighbourhoods and lower socioeconomic neighbourhoods that, that we talked about before diagnosis earlier, parents uh, having access to more support services as well. So there's the, the services are there, but the people have to come to them. Yeah. I mean, the access services the, or the, the difficulty with access to services actually really vary. I mean, it, it varies from, um, from geography. Uh, it varies from perhaps... Uh, access to information and, and, and resources. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can um, perhaps also vary from, from region to region where there might be a lack of uh, professional expertise. So we, we are hearing, for example, in some rural regions, for example, the lack of expertise to psychological services or psychiatric services. So that might be some of the issues. Um, the department has, sort of in the past year again, um, provided about $38 million for, for those who are, um, you know, who at the moment are kind of in a wait list. Uh, and while, while they might be in a wait list, they're still being provided some sort of service. But I think we, we, we need to reiterate that this is not simply an intellectual disability specific type service that's required. I think, I think we should emphasize that uh, the response to people like Andy actually requires a whole of government approach. Uh, how does the department work more closely with justice, uh, with the police, uh, with the advocates? And I think what's really required is, is a more uh, responsive, compassionate approach uh, in dealing with these matters. And so it's not, from my perspective, it is, requires an interdepartmental sort of uh, di you know, approach to this matter. Yeah. Okay, Andy is one of the lucky ones and his charge is dismissed by the judge. Oh, good on you, Andy, I was so worried. Um, which you don't think actually, Dan, is that does make him a lucky one, is that right? You didn't want his charge thrown out before. No, I don't think that's you don't the, want uh, it out. the great the great outcome. Okay. Well, uh, he could easily find himself in front of the judge again, obviously, for stealing minor items, because he doesn't still understand how any of that happened. All he knows is he's back out on the street again. Um, so let's talk about what needs to be done to prevent people with intellectual disabilities like Andy ending up in court and even going to jail. I mean, I'm sure if there was an answer to that, Colleen and John would be most pleased to hear about it. What can we do? I'll just throw it over. Well, Susan, what can we do? Psych uh, psychologist, for those of you playing along at home. Yep. What you have to do is throw money at the beginning of the process, not at the end of the process. The end of the process is the court system, the, the um, prisons and so forth. A very convincing research worldwide that says very often offenders with intellectual disability can be identified because they've got challenging behaviour in preschool. Now, what is being done between preschool 
and 16, 17, 18, then they get into the adult justice system. To keep somebody in a, a high security prison costs about $80,000 a year. That's an awful lot of community services. Per person. Per person. But you don't see a, you see a headline saying dangerous offender locked away for a long time. You don't see one that says we prevented this person becoming a dangerous offender by giving them early intervention services consistently throughout their childhood and adolescence and then helping them in fact to avoid that offending behaviour. Geraldine, I, I think I know the answer to this question. How, how is the Sentencing Advisory Council tackling the issue? We know you're planning. Well, I guess because of our role, which is to inform, engage and advise, we're able to look at the issues in more depth and the issues concerning intellectual disability in the criminal justice system is one that we've identified for research priority. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of smarter court processes, not tougher. And this is an opportunity to look at what that could look like. And also, if a vulnerable person is convicted of an offence, what is the appropriate sentence that should be handed down? Sorry, you've got to pass that mic all the way back now down to my friend Dan. Dan Toombs from Legal Aid. What legislative changes would you like to see made to protect people with intellectual disabilities in the criminal justice system? That's a short question, but a big one. To it. Um, yeah. Look, I, I just don't think it's uh, enough to fix the legislation. Um, at the heart of this issue is lack of funding resources, so that uh, even in the perfect world where you know you had uh, appropriate interventions, um, getting funding for a psychiatrist report or funding for a lawyer to run a, a hearing in the uh, magistrate's court uh, more than likely won't be forthcoming. So it puts the lawyer in, a, in a, an untenable position where um, they're encouraged to enter the plea uh, when, when they don't want to. Um, the other thing that needs to be considered is that uh, you know, in Andy, Andy's case, the charges before the court aren't serious, but summary, some summary charges can be quite serious. And that if they come before the court, uh, the court has to give you know, due consideration to um, how can we protect the community from, from uh, you know, further charges um, against it. So one matter that I was involved in was where a, a young fellow uh, with a, an acquired brain injury was uh, charged with dangerous driving. Now, we went to court on a psychologist's report, and in some respects, thankfully, the, the, the report was a little bit flawed, um, and the, uh, the magistrate found that uh, this particular fellow was fit for trial. Now, why I um, say that, thankfully, the, the, the report was flawed was that there was this growing sense in this young fellow that there was going to be no interventions placed upon him and that he could continue to drive and that he would be given somewhat of a green light to continue in his behaviour. So, um, you know, uh, plugging the legislative deficiencies isn't enough. Uh, the court also has to uh, give strong consideration to the protection of the community and ensure people like Andy and, and others that perhaps will uh, offend more seriously uh, don't impose a risk to it. Gosh. And that's your, your responsibility in the court. I mean, you're protecting the community from perpetrators, uh, potential perpetrators from the court <laughs> because they don't know what's going on. You've got, I mean, we all know you've got a massive responsibility, but are you over it? I mean, do you want to, <laughs> do you get over it? 